Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, members of the East Africa Law Society. Uh, Habariyako, Mwasuze Mutia, and uh, yes, don't, Uganda is catching up with Swahili slowly. So it's we are happy to have you all. My name is Loyola Karowa. I am a mining lawyer in Uganda with the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development. The mandate of the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development is to strategically manage the sustainable exploitation of mineral resources. I work with the Directorate of Geological Survey and Mines, which is the technical arm of the ministry in charge of the administration, regulation of mineral rights and the implementation of law and policy in the mineral sector. And I'm happy to be part of the East African Law Society Mining Law Committee committee and to moderate this webinar. My co-moderator will also introduce herself. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Tabitha Mudoni Mugo. I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. I'm practicing at the firm of Bewatt and Mugani Advocates here in Nairobi. On top of that, I'm also a holder of a Master's of Law degree from the University of Cape Town in the area of mining law and petroleum extraction and use. We are happy to have you on this webinar and we shall be proceeding to start by introducing the speakers. Perhaps um, we can start with Loyola's introduction of the speakers, then I'll proceed to the ones who will take over the first session. Thank you very much. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Tabitha. So we are honored this afternoon to be able to bring you a group of um, speakers who are the best in their fields, who have practiced for a number of years and are able to share with us a lot related on the legal regime of the mining industry. The first speaker I'll introduce is Dennis Kusasira. Dennis is an advocate and a natural resources projects lawyer. He holds a master's degree, an LLM in mineral law and policy with distinction from the University of Dundee in Scotland. He is the managing partner of Abmark Associates. His practice focuses on mining, oil and gas and related litigation. In his mining practice, Dennis has advised on some of the groundbreaking mining projects in Uganda including the Sukulu Phosphate Project, Makutu Rare Earth Elements Project, and Namekara Vermiculite Project. He has done several work. He has done a lot of work in the oil and gas side of the industry, and he has advised Total Energy's ERP on key aspects of the development of the Tilenga Project and currently advises on the implementation of the East African Crude Oil Pipeline. Um, he previously advised a consortium led by a Russian state-owned corporation on its successful bid for the development of a greenfield oil refinery in Uganda. He has extensive experience in commercial litigation and arbitration, and he is consistently ranked by Chambers Global as a highly recommended leading lawyer and in IFLR 1000 as a highly regarded lawyer for the energy and infrastructure project development and project finance. His areas of practice include mining and metals, oil and gas, climate change, and litigation. Uh, join me all in welcoming Dennis Kusasira. Um, the next speaker I have the honor to introduce is from Burundi. Ange Dorin Irakoze is a senior associate at Rubea and Company Advocates, which is a business law firm She's a, a, that is a member of DLA Piper Africa. Um, DLA Piper Africa is a Swiss vereine whose members are comprised of independent law firms in Africa working with DLA Piper. She has over nine years experience in legal practice and is focused on the mining sector given that her PhD research is oriented in the mining sector at the University of Beirut in Germany. She also has significant experience in integration matters and domestication of the East African Community Common Market Protocol and holds a master's degree in East African Community Law and Regional Integration Law from the University of Dar es Salaam School of Law. 
In addition, she has conducted research in legal and regulatory improvement of investment client, climate. Anje is ranked as an up-and-coming lawyer by Chambers and Partners Global Guide 2022. Congratulations. And commentators reported that Anjay is a senior counsel who is increasingly who is an increasingly important lawyer within the group. She advises on a range of corporate and commercial matters, including assisting clients with investments in Burundi. She is also ranked as a rising star by Legal 500 EMEA 2022. Um, she was appointed in February 2018 as a member of the East African Law Society Editorial Board. Welcome, Anjay, and we're happy to have you. you so, I yes, over to you, Tabitha, to introduce uh, two other speakers. Thank you very much, Loyola. I'll start with Ambassador Majar, who is an advocate and senior partner at Rex Advocates, which is in Tanzania. She's also an accredited arbitrator and negotiator. Majar has unrivaled experience in corporate, commercial, and corporate secretarial practice and in the area of corporate governance. She also trained boards of directors of companies in corporate governance in the, in the areas relating to natural resources law in Tanzania. This is mining, oil and gas. And she's also respected uh, amongst the mining companies and her peers. Her expertise includes also banking and finance, competition, and property law and as well as energy law. Then there are also other three Rex partners who um, certain they have joined us and we also have our chair, our chair of the East Africa Committee. He will be introducing himself, Mr. Daudi Ramadani. And Mr. Uh, Ambassador Majar has also chaired many public and private companies and has accumulated wealth of experience in corporate governance and oversight. She's a member of the Tanganyika Law Society, the Bar Association of Tanzania, as well as the East Africa Law Society and the Tanzania Women's Lawyers Association. Welcome to the webinar, Ambassador Majar, and we're happy to have you. We shall, I'll also be introducing Mr. Nyamu Henry Givaka, who is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, but also he is an expert in the area of energy, petroleum and extractive, he is a top performing and highly experienced lawyer in that field and with a focus on delivery of projects in Africa. So he has over 18 years experience and has demonstrated hands-on experience in effective leadership of multicultural team um, and providing critical projects delivery with a special focus on development of petroleum products and renewable energy generation transmission and as well as the smart grid distribution. Some of his key achievements include setting up the new regulatory and compliance departments, department this is in Kenya, as well as, as the achievements of the Kenjen Public Infrastructure Corporate Bond. Um, further, he is the secretary to the technical, he was a secretary to the technical committee which drafted the energy policy in 2015 and is also a founding member of the Ken, which is which founded the development of laws, as well as he has been consulted by the Ministry of Energy in Kenya in setting up various policies. He shall be speaking about some of them. There's so much we can say about Mr. Nyamo. The rest we shall leave it when he is handling his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tabitha. So I have the honor to invite uh, Dawudi Ramadani to give our welcome remarks and let us start. So I will introduce him. Uh, Dawudi is uh, the partner and head, and head of oil and gas department. He's an advocate of the High Court, High Court of Tanzania. He holds a, an LLB from the University of Dar es Salaam and an LLM from the University of Cape Town. He has 12 years experience in the natural resources law practice. He's a partner at Rex Advocates um, have, and has been with the firm for 12 years, having joined as a junior counsel and rising to his current position. He's an enrolled advocate of the High Court of Tanzania. He's also the chairperson of the East African Law Society Mining Law Com Committee. 
His practice experience covers a broad range of areas, including mergers and acquisitions, conducting mining and oil and gas due diligence, advising on the integrity and security of tenure of mining titles, corporate restructuring, drafting, negotiating and reviewing various types of agreements, and so much more. He was part of the team that advised on the acquisition of the leading oil and gas company in Tanzania, um, particularly on issues of antitrust, upstream regulatory approvals, and tax-related matters. He has contributed to various publications concerning the mining sector in Tanzania, and he has also been invited and spoken at several conferences and seminars in the field of mining law and has presented on various aspects of the legal and regulatory from framework governing the extractive sector in Tanzania, including on local content regulations. Welcome, Dawoodi. And yes, please go ahead and give us your welcoming remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Loyola. Um, I would also like to thank um, all the participants and the attendees. Uh, I see we have a very good number. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining um, this first inaugural webinar session of our committee. Uh, as we all know that um, the issue of mining is, uh, is quite crucial. Um, in East Africa, we have been uh, endowed with uh, a rich collection of mineral deposits. And uh, uh, some of them um, uh, are already under exploitation. Um, and we all know that uh, there's a general understanding that uh, um, uh, if optimally and uh, responsibly exploited, these resources have the potential of to substantively contribute to the uh, realization of the regional developments. Unfortunately, uh, in some of the countries, this has not been the case. Um, uh, we have seen also some success stories uh, in other countries, um, but still there are strides which needs to be made. Uh, and it is for this reason that uh, um, the East Africa Law Society saw that uh, it was important to strengthen the members' um, understanding of the, uh, of the issues surrounding this very important sector. Uh, we have seen quite a number of initiatives from different um, organizations such as the African Union um, in the uh, framing of the Africa Mining uh, Vision 2009 with the hope that most African countries would be able to um, uh, adopt these visions uh, in order to promote the sustainable uh, development um, of this sector. But as we all know, the uptake has been very, very um, uh, low. Uh, so there's still um, uh, work needs to be done uh, in this front. So in understanding that um, uh, lawyers have a crucial role to play in the realization of the Africa mining vision, uh, the East Africa Law Society, so the need to come up with a committee dedicated, uh, for, uh, dedicated for these mining uh, issues so that we, the committee can um, spearhead developments, reforms um, of legislations and policy frameworks to regulate the mining sector, and also uh, advising governments and other stakeholders uh, in order to um, improve the regulatory framework. So that there, there, there are varying level of competencies uh, among the East African lawyers uh, to effectively engage in the mining sector, depending on the level of exposure and training that has been attained attained. Uh, however, there are certain um, issues which are common among, among these East African countries, which we thought that uh, through this committee, we should be able to address them um, and learn from other partners, how they've managed to address them, um, see some best cases um, so that we can all uh, uh, move forward. So it is on this basis that um, the ELS considered it necessary to have this committee. Uh, some of the responsibilities for the committee uh, involves the development and uh, uh, to develop and suggest for implementations, products, services, and programs that would advance the interest of the, and capabilities of members in the mining sector, to promote and facilitate members' engagement in national and regional discussions um, around legal policy reforms in the mining sector, 
uh, and also to propose on various strategies which would um, uh, uh, work and, uh, and, 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 and see that you know, the sector uh, uh, is going forward. So most welcome, um, uh, and I really look forward to a fruitful um, uh, contribution from all of you. Karibu Nisana. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dawoodi. And um, a special thanks to all the members of the East Africa Law Society Mining Law Committee who are online and who have put this together. Um, we especially thank our participants who are about 100 now and just a few housekeeping issues. As the webinar goes on, if you have any questions, please type them out in the Q&A box. The Q&A, not the chat. Q and A, and you, we will have a Q and A session which um, where we shall address your questions. So please type them out in the Q and A section as we go ahead. So I'm going to go right on and start um, this very interesting and we hope engaging webinar. And the first discussion we'll have is with Ambassador Maja from Tanzania. And my question to, to you, Ambassador, um, is that is about Tanzania. I would like to explore your vast experience and to learn from you as a country. Now, the United Republic of Tanzania has been hailed as one of the successful mining industries in the region and on the continent. Um, some reports have shown that Tanzania has mining and quarrying has contributed about 5.1% to GDP of the country, um, which is about 3 billion US dollars in 2018. And there are plans to increase that contribution to even 10% by 2025. Tanzania is blessed with several minerals, including gold, iron ore, nickel, cobalt, and an industrial minerals. And so our question is, please give us a background of how, as a country, Tanzania has been able to see this level of success. Um, what's the background of the mining industry in Tanzania and what is its current status? Thank you very much, Loyola. You have my presentation. Um, I have only 10 minutes. I will be very quick in doing the, doing the background. Uh, please um, ignore the content page. Go to the third slide. Um, yes, I mean, Tanzania, we have seen it all. We have seen um, the mineral sector during the command economy. We have seen the mineral sector during the liberal economy. And we have seen um, the fact that that actually drives change, which uh, to some extent is not a bad factor. It's growing nationalism for benefits from extraction of natural wealth. So this kind of nationalism pushes the government to see what it, to, to have policies and legal regime that can ensure mm, benefits to its people. So that resource uh, nationalism now became, of course, something like a political football. Populist politicians uh, use it as capital uh, that we get into power, even when it is the same same um, political party leading. Uh, when we come to power, we are going to deal with bad agreements or change this law or change that law. So we've seen, uh, as you, I will present, um, a lot of changes that happened since 1979, uh, and since independence, by the way, uh, to um, reach where we are, uh, where we are having quite a substantial um, revenue from natural resources. In fact, uh, uh, almost more, more than 40% of our forest revenue comes from natural resource uh, exports. Uh, next, please. So the evolution was, um, the, as I said, continuing debate about local benefits for extraction. And, and um, this began, began more after, uh, 1979, after 1998. 
uh, at Independence, there was no real activity. It was only artisanal mining and, and small-scale mining. Uh, there was only one mine, which was um, the Williamson Diamonds. Uh, so, so um, but this also was uh, shut down um, in 1964. And uh, it was reopened later during the liberalization of the economy. And uh, that was the Mining Act in 1979, which put emphasis on st state owned and control of mineral resources or um, bilateral arrangements, but no investment happened. And then 1995, 2005, there were major reforms that opened up the economy. One of the leading reforms was the review of the policy and legal regime for the mineral sector, ending up with the 1998 Mining Act, um, which became quite um, successful, but also a, a, a piece of legislation that attracted a lot of criticism uh, over the years. Next, please. Next, please, Loyola. So um, the state mining corporation at that time, of course, um, um, didn't uh, was failing. Didn't make any profits. Didn't do any additional exploration, and like many other public corporations, underperformed um, badly. Um, there were um, major economic reforms in the 1980s, but real reforms happened in the 1990s when uh, state corporations were sold, but Stamico survived the sale, actually. And it has been revived, and we hopefully is going to uh, be a, a leading um, state corporation in the mineral sector. Not yet, but we hopefully it will. Um, next. So the 1990s reforms um, went into the uh, mining law and the policy. The government said, we are going to to actually regulate but not to do business we will not have a stake in the mineral sector we will encourage the private sector it's the private sector is going to be the engine for growth and yes there was there was huge success and uh, by 1999 tanzania had attracted over uh, 2 billion um, uh, us dollars in mining in mineral investment and by 2004, there were four major uh, leading mining, uh, uh, mining companies uh, already operating mines in Tanzania. Next, please. Now, um, the, the, the mining boom and the mining revenue was expected to, to, to help into poverty reduction. That didn't happen, for sure. Now, um, there were questions. Uh, uh, it was a very liberal uh, legislation by the terms of nationalist uh, um, sentiments, in the sense that there were tax exemptions, there were um, issues concerning um, um, title, ownership of minerals, and, uh, dispute resolution, and things that gave um, appetite to investors but which um, people uh, looking into uh, local benefits, we considered that that was a bit more generous. And uh, there were now these uh, commis review committees and commissions that were established. The first one was uh, one that was led by a Dr. Kipo Kola in 2004. And for him, he, he thought, which at that time uh, was right, uh, the regime was good. It attracted the investment we were looking for for many years, but there was no appropriate oversight on the part of government and government agencies in a sector which ballooned, and which was true, because the World Bank supported reforms, included institutional reform, which didn't happen. I was also not happy with the tax incentives, and it did make certain recommendations. One of uh, them was to overhaul the institutional structure of governance, which really didn't happen. The, they increased the capacity, introduced um, um, agencies that would monitor revenue and uh, do audit uh, and, and, and um, see if that would help. But that was uh, not really much and, and, and recommended uh, the, some of the incentives be removed, like allowance for, for capital expenditure and certain tax exemptions and, and on, on fuel and custom duties 
uh, uh, be removed and which were removed uh, immediately. But as you will see in the next slide, please, next one, um, this was not enough. Um, there was another when the, the, the fourth first government, Jaka Kikwete, came to power. They also came with a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, promises that making the uh, mineral sector uh, give more. And there was a, 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 another committee which was headed by a deputy minister for minerals, Lau Masha, which again uh, went after the tax regime and incentives uh, met there, not really addressing the institutional incapacity which um, had not been addressed and where you have the same same ministry, the same same people, in fact the best left for the sector. So you don't really have the kind of oversight that you'd expect in, in a sector that had exploded um, in, uh, out of its proportions. So he recommended again to look into the tax regime. And, um, but the, the, the recommendations were not far reaching enough and uh, there was still a lot of complaints. There was another committee which was um, uh, chaired by a former judge and an, an advocate of the High Court, um, late Mark Bomani. And he re produced what is now known as a uh, Bomani report, which concluded that the reason Tanzania has not benefited as much from its mining uh, were an inadequate oversight of the sector, which I think even today it's a problem and over generous tax incentives, which with the back, uh, with the hindsight, um, he, he might have been right, but not, not exactly at the time of the uh, uh, creation of the uh, incentive regimes, because that was hedged against what other African countries were doing. And then there was lack of government equity participation. At that time, he was of the firm view that there must be government equity participation in the mineral sector. So um, again, as you will see in the next uh, slide, next please, um, there, there, there was now, um, uh, subsequent to this Bomani report, government launched what it was known as sustainable management of the mineral sector resource project, which was in 2010, which was intended to strengthen the government's capacity in the management of the mineral sector focusing on socioeconomic impacts, government capacity, geological survey to promote further growth of the sector, and of course, um, additional investment, continuous um, 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 prospecting. And there were some results uh, where we had uh, the new Mining Act, uh, uh, the 1998 Act repealed and replaced by the 2010 Mining Act. Um, we had fiscal regime which was uh, extensively actually amended and it was no longer a special fiscal regime for the mineral uh, sector, including um, ring fencing uh, certain provisions uh, to change the basics of royalty calculation from net back value to gross value. Some people will understand what it means and to increase royalty rates and abolition of VAT or special relief and the fuel tax exemptions. This again was a major attack on the taxes and as we speak today, uh, the tax uh, benefits that were uh, um, availed uh, were almost completely removed. And as of today, after 2017, a, 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 an investor in the mineral sector who takes advantage of a tax benefit will have to pay through equity to giving equity to the government that I give you tax, which means I'm offering these taxes but you're going to give me shares instead. And uh, that can be up to 50%, as you will see. So the result of the reforms of uh, revenues went up, um, but uh, reaching to up to about a billion uh, T shillings. But that was not really much uh, compared to what uh, eventually came uh, to, to pass. Uh, royalty payments and corporate tax payments. That was corporate tax payment for the first time because of the change in the law. Uh, companies kept declaring losses, losses when actually they were not making losses. Then there was increase in other taxes too, which um, um, became quite outstanding. But of course, notwithstanding the success, which is in inverted commas, because um, they were never considered a success, the concerns remained as they became more political, uh, capital, and uh, every new government that came to office uh, was uh, attacking uh, the mineral sector. 
So uh, next one. Uh, then there was, uh, that came 2017 um, under Magufuli. There was a, 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 a full overhaul of the regulatory regime for the mineral sector. Sweeping changes were introduced by three pieces of legislation. One was through written laws and miscellaneous amendments, uh, which made substantial changes uh, to the Mining Act 2010. In fact, it should have repealed the act, but it did uh, still uh, do amendments. And then there was Natural Wealth and Resource Permanent Sovereignty Act, which was intended to, to give more sovereign authority over natural resources, and also introduced certain things like abolished government um, uh, submission to foreign arbitral bodies to which quite a number of uh, mining companies had gone because they had this access to international arbitral process through the, through the uh, Mining Act and through the Tanzania Investment Act. And then the other one was the Natural Wealth and Resource Review and Renegotiation of Unconscionable Terms Act. This act gave parliament powers to actually renegotiate existing development, mine development agreements. So uh, the next uh, slide, I will discuss some of those uh, changes, was um, government was entitled, became entitled to 16% free garret interest and given it also mandate to have, um, to appoint two members on the board of directors. The free carried interest may increase to about 50% if a company seeks and gets uh, tax um, allowances. Uh, this, of course, became a deterrent. Uh, the mining companies will do their numbers, but will never dare ask for tax um, exemption. Um, prohibited disputes resolution in foreign courts or arbitral tribunal. And in fact, subsequently, a new legislation on arbitration was introduced, uh, repeating those requirements and making it an unconscionable a, a um, uh, provision if you have such a provision in a natural resource contract. Parliament was given wide powers to review existing and new agreements and to order uh, a rejection or expansion of a terms deemed unconscionable. This has not happened um, and it's not abnormal. We sometimes have a very um, laws that are passed with such a popular mandate uh, but uh, in practice, it becomes almost impossible to actually implement them. And this is an issue in between the negotiations that are going on, especially in the oil uh, and gas uh, sector at the moment. Abolishment of export of raw minerals requiring local beneficiation. Now, this was a very good intention, but that does not happen overnight. In fact, uh, it, it eventually this had to be um, overlooked and export of raw minerals still happen, but we know that there are beneficiation um, centers that are being built now, so hopefully this can become operational as we come. And then uh, there is the, there were local content provisions under um, the um, 2016, 2010 Act legislation, but these ones at the moment now are quite strict and they are the oversight by the Mining Commission uh, is quite strict, including abolition of foreign lawyers from providing legal services to the Natural Resource Center. Now, the problem is, uh, um, yeah, yeah, the problem is now uh, that um, that is not being observed. We can see now uh, foreign law firms um, providing this kind of service. Rex was part of the ENS Africa, and we separated because of this legislation. Uh, but we see those who are still um, associated with with uh, foreign firms um, practicing. So we don't know what is happening. We'll, we are looking and watching. Um, there were a lot of increase in royalties and from uh, and um, uh, and on all minerals, and also um, there were. Uh, uh, various laws that gave state monopoly in handling of export of minerals, um, which cannot be handled by any, uh, in, any other clearing and forwarding agent. Now, uh, sorry, that XX there, it's because I wanted to get the actual figure, which I have yet to find, but I know revenues uh, went surged uh, to a very, very substantial um, level, and um, 
measuring the success through revenues, it has been quite, quite successful, I can say. Um, so after these reforms, uh, um, can we say now Tanzania, you have the best, you are happy? No, because um, we can measure success through revenues, but also we need to strike some kind of a balance. We must be able to continue to attract um, uh, the junior companies that uh, uh, undertake exploration and then the uh, large scale mining companies that in, uh, invest. We've had uh, companies that have uh, recently been um, given uh, mining licenses, but they're still talking to government about certain other provisions which we haven't introduced, uh, discussed about the changes, including um, borrowings. Uh, third part borrowings and borrowings from uh, from the shareholders and the treatment of the uh, debts uh, which are taken as a distribution when payment is happening and government would want to get an equity on it so these are some of the issues that are a bit of a challenge so can we say that the law is perfect far from that um, we still it will definitely continue to be um, changed and uh, reformed depending on what happens because laws cannot be um, static Plus, they reflect the policy of the government in place. At the moment, the government is focused on attracting investment. Some of the changes may not actually attract investment, especially those go into the tenure. Uh, that cannot be guaranteed because not only of certain default provisions that are brought by subsidiary legislation, but also some which are brought by other laws like the Companies Act, um, which um, I cannot discuss here now because it's, uh, my time is very limited. So what I would say is uh, it's one thing to have good law and it's another to have that will actually um, be applied in a manner that will give the benefits that are intended. And that looks into oversight. And the issue of oversight is something that is, of, again, of another day um, to discuss. But we know, despite all the changes and all the benefits and all the reforms that have happened, we still have an issue of oversight. And the oversight still needs to, to improve and needs to be reorganized in a way that will, will bring more uh, comfort in the sector in terms of those who have to comply and those who have to have oversight of compliance. Uh, with that, I think I should end here and um, wait for additional discussions uh, in the next uh, when we, I hear from my other colleagues. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Majada. That was such a, a loaded presentation. I'm, I'm sure lots of our participants have so many questions and things to unpack. So I will remind everybody who's online, please type your message in the Q&A box on Zoom. And we, your, your question, if you have a question or comment, please type it in the Q&A box and we will address that during a Q&A session. So yes, please don't, don't um, uh, so please type your questions there. We are, thank you so much, Ambassador Maja. I think your presentation has highlighted so many aspects that I'm sure everybody else is going to talk about. Tanzania has gone through a lot of law reform, um, but a few things stand out. The tax regime, financial and tax incentives, state equity participation, and really, and most recent 2017 overhaul, and like you concluded, oversight and institutional capacity of those oversight agencies are very major factors in the mining industry. So I'll just pick up from that um, to my next speaker. After we've understood all the evolution that law and policy in mining can go through, now, when we come to the more practical aspects, especially from legal practice, what do advocates need to know about the mining legal regime as they practice? So for this, we're going to have a discussion and a presentation from Dennis, from Dennis Kusasira. Um, I'll just confirm IT may put up his presentation. So my question to you, Dennis, is having advised on several um, billion dollar projects and still doing so, what aspects of the legal regime 
do you highlight in your practice? What aspects are front and center and are necessary for members and advocates to be well aware of? Thank you very much, Loyola, and thank you very much, Ambassador. That was very uh, enlightening about Tanzania and what they did uh, in order to be where they are. I think, um, kindly just go to the, to the next slide. Yeah, I think the most important thing, first of all, is to understand what mining law is. If you don't understand what mining law is, you may fail to identify where the opportunities are. I have seen this happening many times um, in a mining uh, law, in mining practice, oil and gas, even electricity. Uh, when you talk about mining law practice, people tend to think it's only the Mining Act, or if it's petroleum, it's petroleum law, petroleum act. If it's electricity, they think it's only the electricity act, and you find everybody is looking for who is looking to build their practice in mining, they are focusing on only one piece of legislation and fail to understand exactly what this practice is all about. Um, from a national perspective, actually, mining law is a legal framework that governs the development of mineral resources. It normally provides for ownership of mineral resources and the rules and procedure for acquisition of the right to exploit or to explore and extract those minerals. It also normally defines the relationship between the state in, in countries where minerals are vested in the state as uh, those all, all the countries in East Africa. So it defines the relationship between the state, the miners, surface rights holders, and those are the landowners or occupiers, the local communities, as well as other actors involved. Uh, in the mineral resource development, and those could be contractors, could be service providers, etc. Uh, mining law is not always one piece of legislation, actually. Uh, mining law is a multi layered uh, pieces of legislation, but it normally has one principal legislation, uh, usually called the Mining Act in most countries. In Uganda, I think it's the Mining and Minerals Act. Previously, it was the Mining Act, and I think in Tanzania and Kenya, it's still the Mining Act. That law is uh, normally implemented in compliance and or in conjunction with other laws, and those other laws can be numerous. But the, the critical ones that I've seen from my practice that interact so heavily with mining uh, projects is uh, you know, land laws, because as you know, minerals occur uh, majorly, you know, on land or under the land. So in, in countries in East Africa, you're going to find that there's a split estate. The land belongs to, at least in Uganda, to the people and the minerals to, to the state. Even in countries where land belongs to, 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 to the state, you still have a, a kind of a split estate that you getting a land title for the area where you build your house does not entitle you to undertake uh, mining operations, doesn't vest those minerals in you. So environmental laws and those also abroad, you have the typical environmental laws that deal with pollution, that deal with um, um, water, uh, in the deal with uh, health and safety, such as laws governing the utilization of explosives, uh, the laws governing uh, safety of workplace, occupational health and safety laws. And then the commercial laws could be contracts, uh, company law, uh, partnership, ETC, and then you have, of course, tax laws that are actually the knife that slice the cake between the miners and the, the, the state. So you, you always have to understand how these laws interact with the mining law. And then you're able to pick up where the risks are that investors look at to be advised on. What is the compliance say, that the investors are looking for, not only with the Mining Act, but also other laws. Uh, for large projects, we have seen uh, mining laws uh, being implemented together with state agreements 
In Uganda, they are known as mineral agreements, and I believe in Tanzania, they are known as such. And uh, at least as far as I know, in most of the East African states, these agreements must be consistent with the mining law itself. There are countries that uh, we are, you know, uh, regulating mineral business through both legislation and agreement, and um, you could find instances where the agreement is actually inconsistent with the mining laws, and that has to be itself enacted by parliament. And I think the, 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 the close example that I can recall is Australia and uh, countries such as Papua New Guinea. But in, in East Africa, particularly Uganda, the agreement has to be consistent with the, with the, with the law. So you would ask then why, if it's consistent with the law, why do I need the agreement? It normally gives some extra support to the, to the project and uh, clarifies also certain things that are gray and uh, gives uh, you know, comfort to the investors by providing for uh, dispute resolution mechanism, you know, support in project financing or projects ETC. In Uganda, just a minute. Sorry about that. So in Uganda, we have got uh, the mining law comprised of specific laws um, and then other laws. Of course, you have got the constitution of the Republic of Uganda, which vests all minerals in the government on behalf of the state. And uh, this uh, provision of the constitution empowers the parliament to make laws to regulate the exploration and uh, mining of minerals. And then the parliament has made recently the Mining and Minerals Act. This is not yet effective, but I have decided to focus on this because it's a question of time. The moment this law is assented to by the president, then it will become you know, effective. Um, there's no point going to the current act, which is, about, which is in its sunset. Then you have, of course, as I said, environmental laws, land laws, commercial laws, and tax laws. Next slide, please. And then, of course, the mining law always provide for the institutional framework, which you must know very well if you are to advise uh, properly the investors or whoever is involved in the mining sector or mineral development. In Uganda, we have the Ministry of Energy, uh, which is the licensing uh, uh, authority. And under it, we have the Directorate of Geological Survey and Mines that also is uh, made up of uh, three departments, the Department of Mines, Department of Mining Cadastre, and then the Geothermal Department. My presentation, I'm just focusing on the, on the first two. I've left out Geothermal because I think it's much more of an energy uh, mineral. Um, most of the stuff that is in Geothermal is not something that I've dealt with before. Um, and I will focus on these. Mines department regulates and monitor uh, operations of mining companies, exploration companies, and then it enforces the, the, the act, assesses royalties, and uh, develops standards in conjunction with uh, the Uganda National Bureau of Standards, uh, standards that are supposed to be followed in uh, conducting mining business. Could be you know standards to do with uh, the equipment that you're bringing, uh, what you're using as, as, as raw materials, ETC. And then uh, you have the mining cadaster department that does the evaluation function when the application is made to the minister. The minister is not going to sit, sit down and evaluate the application. They have to send it to the experts who are in the mining cadaster department who will evaluate the application and uh, send the recommendation to the minister to grant or not to grant the application. And then also they maintain the register of mineral rights and also produce and generate, generate and produce maps that are used in uh, conducting exploration operations. Then of course, recently um, we've seen the government of Uganda, which was also in the mode of no state participation, uh, wanting to get a piece of the cake directly 
by participating in mineral projects. So the mining, the new mining law is establishing the national mining company to participate in mineral projects on behalf of the state and uh, to conduct also exploration in areas and mining in areas where private entities are not willing to invest. Next slide, please. Yeah, the licensing in Uganda is uh, on a first come, first serve basis, but uh, applicants must also satisfy requirements uh, under the Act. So it's not that when you are the first to apply, you should be given as a must, you should satisfy certain requirements under the Act. Uh, competitive bidding could be applied where the government has sufficient information on mineralization and therefore able to run uh, a competition. Uh, as I said earlier, government can enter into support agreements for large and com complex projects to provide some extra support and clarify certain gray areas. And there, there is government participation at 15% free carry from exploration production and uh, the option of government to increase its equity participation by contributing up to an additional maximum 30%, this time paid equity on terms agreed by uh, with the companies that hold the mineral rights. So we, we have a mining law now, uh, previously there was more upstream centered, but now we have the upstream uh, part, which is to do with the exploration and mining or extraction. And then you have the midstream, which is processing, smelting. Actually midstream is probably refining and smelting because some of the processing happens upstream. And then we have a bit of downstream where we have mineral dealers and people who are manufacturing items or articles through, I mean, uh, from uh, uh, precious uh, metals. The licenses, of course, we have the prospecting license, which is general and uh, does not tie to a specific area. It is uh, granted for one year, non-renewable, and it's not transferable. Uh, then the exploration license, which uh, gives the, the holder the right to explore minerals in a defined area, is normally granted for a period of four years and uh, can be renewed for another three. But uh, every time it's renewed, uh, the, the, the holder has to lose half of, of the area unless the, the directorate or the minister in its discretion upon recommendation of the directorate believes that the mineralization you know exceeds beyond the the other half and it would not be uh, fair to 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 have the other part reduced where the person has invested a lot of money um the exploration license of course entitles the holder the exclusive right to explore for minerals in the relevant area and then the exclusive right to apply for a mining license. It's transferable, but subject to the minister's consent. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, again, upstream license is continued is a mining uh, license. Uh, it uh, is granted to enable mining operations, uh, which is basically the extraction of minerals from the ground. And uh, it's uh, 21 years, uh, can be renewed for 15 or the life of the ore body, whichever is shorter for the large scale mines. And uh, if for medium scale, it's uh, 10 years initially and can be renewed for another 10. And then for small scale, it's seven, can be renewed for three. And then for the artisanal is uh, two plus two each time. Uh, of course, it entitles uh, the holder to extract the minerals in the relevant area, and uh, it's transferable with the consent of the minister. Then uh, there are instances where a person may uh, discover a deposit that is exploitable, but in the future could not be exploitable because of uh, circumstances beyond their control, and those could be economic, such as market and technological, for example, where the technology that is available is not uh, uh, suitable for processing the minerals that have been uh, discovered. I've, I've, I've seen that happen in one of the projects I've advised on, where the iron ore that occurs in the area where the project is cannot be <clears throat> processed to the required standard using the current technology. Uh, so in such a scenario, you can apply for a retention license to retain the area until the circumstances improve, but that also is time bound 
three years initially and then it can be renewed to another two for another two but it gives you the right the exclusive right to apply for a mining lease in that area uh, and it's transferable with the minister's consent so these exclusive rights that i keep talking about on all these these licenses is actually to provide for what we call security of tenure of a mineral right which is very critical uh, for financing of mineral uh, development projects next slide yeah uh, then we have the midstream licenses uh, which is mineral processing license which is uh, uh, for purposes of um, uh, uh, pro pro processing the mineral the raw ore that has been extracted from the ground into concentrate uh, it's a duration of given for a duration of five years can be renewed for three uh, I must say state that if you have a mining lease you probably don't need this but you can have instances where you have a, a, a disintegrated uh, project where one 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 player is focusing on mining and you have one who is uh, setting up a processing plant that is the person that requires the processing license and then you have a smelting license which is uh actually uh, given for purposes of uh, extraction of metal from the ore by processing in involving heating and melting of, of, of the metal and uh, it also it gives you the exclusive right to do that uh, for the minerals that you have acquired from upstream uh, companies next please then you have the refining uh refining uh, license which is for purposes of purifying the minerals and other mineral products derived from mineral ore to produce metal or compound these are what is required in the downstream market for making uh, what is required from those mineral products it's, it's given for a duration of 15 and can be renewed for five i think it's transferable but with the consent of the minister we can go to the next uh slide yeah so the downstream uh uh is 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 uh, where now you go for the people who are using can we go back to yeah people who are using the, the companies or players that are using the mineral products that have been produced from mining to refining and uh, smelting uh use those products <clears throat> to make uh, final usable products like you know steel bars iron sheets etc um those would need uh, you know a mineral dealer's license to buy minerals to be able to use them in the downstream market and others are exporting them uh, to the export market for example if you want to buy gold in uganda if you're not the holder of a mining license then you need uh, a mineral dealer's license and then the goldsmith license which is for manufacturing articles from precious metals these are both for one calendar years meaning they expire on 31st december from the time you you apply if you apply for it on 30th december it will expire the next day um yeah the rights that this grant are very obvious i don't need to go through them and uh, lastly the next slide yeah so I could not jump straight to the forefront of what really the lawyer does in legal practice in, in the mining business or mining practice without going through what I've taken you through. But now that I've shown you what the mining law is and uh, what require what your, your necessity to, to understand that it's not one piece of legislation, you must know other laws that interact with this law. Then you can be able to practice in that in that in that space, and uh, what I've seen happening, which I can't just gloss over, is uh, uh, advising on acquisition of mineral rights under the Act. There are many companies or individuals that would like to acquire rights, but they don't know how to go about it. They can consult you as a lawyer, and you can advise them on how to go about it. And then there are those that want to acquire interest in already existing, already acquired mineral rights. And uh, you can advise on structuring of those transactions for acquisition of those licenses or interests in them through, you know, either a direct purchase of the asset or through share purchase in the company that holds the right or through joint ventures. 
And then you can also advise on acquisition of surface rights at different stages of the mineral uh, project. Uh, the, 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 the surface rights are really the permission for you to use the surface of the land, since we earlier said that land and the minerals are separate in most of these countries uh, in East Africa. And uh, you will find that what you, the kind of right you need for exploration is not necessarily the one you need for mining. Exploration is an uh, information gathering activity does not require you to have exclusive possession of the surface of the land, or even to have very long term rights uh, to use the land. Whereas mining has serious inroads on the land and uh, can actually destroy the land. So you will find that uh, depending on what mineral, I mean, land tenure system operates in the country where you are, you could, you know, take out a lease, you could do, actually do an outright purchase of the land, and then use it for purposes of uh, conducting uh, mining operations. And then you can also advise on, you know, environment, health and safety aspects, uh, right from, you know, supporting environmental impact assessment, uh, resettlement action plan for compensation of affected persons and uh, community development agreements. Um, and uh, the most interesting one that I've found in, in my practice is tax structuring and planning for domestic tax and treaty benefit optimization uh, for mineral projects that, that, that I find very interesting and quite, quite engaging. Um, you can also negotiate on behalf of, of, of mining companies, the support agreements uh, where government is amenable to enter into one and uh, you know deal with uh, several several aspects that uh, lenders and investors want to see happen before they can commit to invest in money in projects. And of course, uh, most lawyers know about dispute resolution you will find a lot of uh, administrative law remedies in this practice because uh, most of the time you're either challenging the, 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 the refusal to grant of, of a, a mineral right or unlawful cancellation or unlawful interference by the state itself. And then you will find litigation between the miners and the landowners, between miners and the service providers. And then of course, arbitration between the state and expert determination. These are the areas that I've seen that happen a lot. But for the common practitioner or general practitioner, you think about company flotation, think about drawing contracts, employment law, immigration, all those uh, support a mineral project and you can be able to do them if you want to practice in this space. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Dennis, thank you very much again for very for another very loaded presentation and I'm sure our participants have enjoyed us and have a few questions. So I just remind everyone if you have any question um, from the past two presentations, just type it out in the Q&A box. Several things have stood out in Dennis's presentation, but fundamentally it's understanding what mining law is and the entire framework that contributes to the industry so that as members and as advocates, we are able to provide good advisory services. I think you can highlight, you can see how a lot of his presentation focused on advisory services and um, eventually dispute resolution. But if advice, you know, has been sufficient, um, no minor would like to end up in dispute resolution. So for the next session of our webinar i will hand over to my colleague tabitha we have heard from tanzania we've heard from uganda and tabitha will lead us um, with the next speakers over to you mugo thank you loyola and thank you to the speakers who have just um, taken us through the two sessions in relating to uganda and tanzania so we know that um kenya has made a lot of strides when it comes to the mining sector so in terms of, um, it has provided geological data to enable mining companies and explorers at the click of the button to locate and also identify areas where mining activities can take place. For example, there's the mining cadastre portal, which provides a map 
it's a map out of where licenses have already been issued under the new regime and under the old regime licenses, which includes artisanal and quarrying um, activities for mining. And also there's a national geodata center, which is a repository for the Kenyan geoscientific data and a one-stop shop for information relating to mining and geological activities because mining and uh, ge geological activities goes hand in hand. We need to locate where the minerals are before they are, ex they are exploited. So I will hand over to Mr. Nyamo who will be taking us through the regime in Kenya relating to mining. And I will also pose a question to him. Um, mining projects are inevitably large infrastructure projects. So how can Kenyan advocates, as well as those in East Africa, position themselves to advise in these projects? Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll request that uh, I just share the slides from my end so that I'm able to <laughs> manage them. Um, that is fine. We have them? Yes, I can see your slides. All right. Uh, thanks for uh, having me on this uh, webinar and uh, for allowing me to, to share some thoughts around uh, the Kenyan scenario and uh, the emerging areas that I believe would be of interest to lawyers. Um, I have to maybe give a couple of uh, initial comments. The first one is uh, that uh, the, the presentation that I'm making is uh, basically my uh, personal uh, uh, findings as an advocate. And uh, secondly, that uh, on the petroleum section, I will not manage to maybe uh, comment on questions, uh, although I did look more at the mining than petroleum, because uh, in the Kenyan context, we, we have a dichotomy between mining, petroleum, and also we do have a split between uh, uh, mining and geothermal. So I, I did look more at the mining uh, part of it, but I do have some slides on the um, the other two. So if I one of the things I've learned as an advocate in in a lot of these projects, the first thing that any advocate requires is a set of good boots and uh, a set of very good uh, clothes for walking and, and being out in the outdoors. Because for us, that's one of the things that most lawyers are not, most advocates and, and lawyers are not familiar with. But if you move into this sector, it's some things that you have to uh, get get used to. Um, also, I would I would say that from my limited experience, when I look at uh, Kenya, I think we are still in the formative stages of the of mining uh, specifically. If if we are to compare with, uh, for example, Tanzania, uh, Zambia, and some of our uh, sister nations uh, around Africa, those they are they are big players in this sector. And uh, in comparison, I would say we are we are getting there, but. Uh, they are way ahead. If you look at um, some of the mines like Kansanshi, maybe in Zambia, um, if you look at uh, Barik, uh, Gold, um, Mamba, those mines are huge. Mashamba in DRC, those are huge, huge mines. If you look at Tanzanian mines, those are huge, huge uh, infrastructure projects. And um, they they have really way ahead uh, when it comes to that sector. And we we are we are catching and learning from them, catching up and learning from them. But there's quite a lot uh, that that we need to from there. So I do have quite a number of slides, and I will try and move through them very quickly because, as um, as the presenter Dennis said, it would be important to understand the outline of the Kenyan law in respect to the mining sector before we look at what are the areas that would be of interest to to advocates um, in it. So uh, if we look at globally, uh, extractive sector consists of oil, gas, and mining, and, and uh, also geothermal, if we were to talk of energy part. But for Kenya, we have split the mining, oil, and gas, and, and uh, also uh, geothermal. So in, in this 
uh, presentation, I will deal more with the mining and minerals uh, than with the oil and gas and geothermal, but there's some mention of them uh, in it. We do have some minerals in Kenya. We've, we do have soda, titanium, nobium, gold, coal. We have iron ore, limestone, and there's quite a bit of, uh, we recently had commercial uh, petroleum deposits that have been found in, uh, in the northern part of Kenya. We do have gas finds uh, around uh, northern part of Kenya and also in the part of the coastal blocks. The legislations that cover Kenyan uh, law for mining sector, uh, I've touched on the constitution of Kenya. There's the natural resources, classes of transactions, subject ratification act, it's a mouthful. We have the mining act, you have the petroleum act, and uh, we have the MCA in relation to the environment and county laws. There are many other um, laws and regulations that touch on, on mining, and I've just tried to concentrate on these ones. Uh, but for example, if we were to look at uh, the constitution, when you look at the definition of land in the Kenyan constitution, it includes uh, natural resources uh, com contained in or under the, the uh, under the surface and th that then when we go to the land laws in Kenya they do also affect like the land act you find that uh, they do affect uh, natural resources just based on the on the uh, on the constitution the definition of uh, natural resources in the constitution um, includes uh, sunlight it's an interesting one, surface and groundwater, forest, biodiversity and genetic resources, and more of what you're looking at, like rocks, minerals, fossil fuels, and uh, sources of energy. We also find that the constitution defines uh, public land uh, as minerals and mineral oils to fall under public land. And that's a very interesting definition in as far as this concern. Then the constitution still has the right to a clean and healthy environment, uh land management equity efficient productive sustainability those are the themes that come out of the constitution article 66 also talks about uh, very important that parliament will enact legislation ensuring that investments in property benefit local communities and their economies and and this basically means any investment in mining should in effect benefit the local uh, community then um, it bestows on the state, Article 69, uh, the responsibility to ensure that that sustainable uh, exploitation and utilization is equitable and is also for the for future generations. It's shared between the, the current generations and the future generations, and further that the national and county governments uh, benefit, including the local communities. And we will find this as we go along into the, the laws. Now, in relation to agreements on natural resources, there's a requirement that all those uh, regulations under Article 71 are re they require to be ratified um, by Parliament, and uh, this also requires Parliament to enact a legislation that will provide for ratification of those uh, uh, contracts and um, or concessions. If we finally, if we look at the uh, constitution, there is uh, under Schedule 4, the national government's role includes protection of environment and natural resources, uh, general principles of land planning and coordination of land planning and disaster management. And, and these themes will come out as we go into the actual laws um, dealing with the uh, minerals. The county governments also have specific roles. So in Kenya, we have the national government and we have 47 county governments, uh, which, which are regional governments formed under the constitution and have specific roles that they carry out. So those include land planning and development within the county, control of pollution, land rates and uh, trade, license, trade licenses. They implement the national government policies on natural resources, firefighting and disaster management, and coordination of the participation of communities and uh, in governance at the local level. And that's that's quite key in terms of uh, the Mining Act, which, which will come out uh, in a short while. 
So when you look at the natural resources classes of transactions subject to ratification act, this was formed, uh, this act was, an, it was enacted based on article 71 of the constitution. And the transactions are subject to ratification by parliament if they grant a right or a concession and uh, have been entered into after the effective date of the constitution. Now, this act provides that uh, a transaction uh, that involves the grant in part B, the grant of a right or a concession by, to a private person uh, is required to be ratified by parliament. And this have to be presented before parliament and there's a process how it is presented uh, before parliament. And the act provides that, uh, that includes authorization to extract crude oil and natural gas. So it also it, it, the act provides both for minerals as we would call it in Kenya, for mining and also for uh, petroleum and natural gas. And uh, that is submitted by the, the CS in charge of the natural resource. So for example, if it's petroleum, it is submitted by the CS in charge of petroleum. If it's mining, it is uh, the CS, I mean the cabinet secretary, it is uh, who is a minister. It is submitted by the minister in charge of mining. And uh, once it goes to the National Assembly, there's a time frame within which the National Assembly will review it and then forward it to the Senate. And it, there is a, a, a dispute resolution mechanism. If, for example, one of the houses passes the contract and the other one uh, stipulates that maybe they have some query. So there is a constitutional uh, mechanism to enable that uh, issue to be resolved. Once ratified, then it is issued. So the classes of transactions that are that require ratification in Kenya, ratification in parliament, they include uh, the ones here, you can see in the table, the second one is minerals. Uh, others are underground water resources, issues to do with forest, wildlife, uh, crude oil and natural gas. And, and I'm sorry for the speed, it's because of uh, time. We have a mining act, uh, which is it's basically in charge of uh, mining. Uh, precious metals uh, and all that, and it it uh, took over what some initial acts that were repealed. Um, Section 17 establishes Directorate of Mines and Directorate of Geological Survey, and I believe that's where the uh, cadaster map and the geodata center would would are housed, um, and they manage the activities, including environmental aspects, social heritage, other than the technical part of it. They also manage the environmental impact assessment, uh, which if you are to get a license, you will require those approvals. So they are the ones who ensure that those approvals are in place before a license is issued. Um, and uh, site mitigation, rehabilitation, all those things. Uh, the act also provides uh, for a mineral rights board, which uh, advises the cabinet secretary on the fees uh, grant rejection retention. We now have a national mining corporation in Kenya, and, and that's similar to ZCCM IH, for example, for Zambia, which uh, is in charge of, uh, of the government's participation in mining. Coincidentally, uh, the and I use Zambia as an example because I've, I've worked there. Um, it, Zambia is, uh, the Zambian government has a very interesting and very positive uh, scenario that they are the largest shareholder in the mining sector in the country by the fact that they are shareholders in each of the large scale mining projects that on, are ongoing within Zambia. So they then have a uh, shareholding in each of those uh, um, mining operations. So Kenya has now in, in the act has uh, a national mining corporation, which in my view, would take up that role. And uh, we also have uh, a commodity exchange under the act, uh, which will, will en enable uh, security in mineral trade uh, transactions. There's a role for NLC, um, specifically where there's a requirement for land that for mine, for land for a mining operation, which land falls under community land. That is uh, one of the uh, types of land we have in Kenya. We have public land, which is mainly land owned by the government in, in its own various agencies. We have community land, which is land 
owned by the local community and currently held in trust by the county governments. And we have private land, the normal private land, which uh, would be on either freehold or leasehold uh, titles. Um, we also, the Act also establishes county offices uh, for mining and also county artisanal, artisanal mining committees. And these are very important because they're the ones which assist the Ministry of Mining in managing uh, mining activities, artisanal mining activities in the counties, uh, together with the county government uh, and the county office. Um, the government participation in mining license. So this is what I was talking about in respect to Zambia, uh, what they, they did, Kenya also has the state uh, shall acquire 10% free carried interest in share capital of the right um, in, in terms of financial contribution. We have local equity participation where there's a specific capital expenditure. Uh, uh, it exceeds the CSS prescribed amount. Then 20% of that uh, capital expenditure will be equity that will be raised on a local stock exchange within three years after commencement of production. And these are some of the areas I will be highlighting uh, which are opportunities for lawyers. And then there's a preference for local products. Um, there are three major types of operations, uh, large scale, small scale, and artisanal mining operations. And in the presentation, I've provided for the types of licenses and the sections that each of those licenses have. So for example, if I just run through the large scale operations, we have reconnaissance license, prospecting license, retention license, a mining license, and we also have mining agreements. So those are, you can easily find them in the act uh, in relation to them. Uh, the retention license I thought was of interest because this is where if you are prospecting and you identify amino deposit with a commercial significance, then there is a license that you can be given for a specific period. Um, if, if there are many reasons that you might not be able to mine at that specific time, and you could be allowed to hold that area for, for a certain period, specific period, and then after that be required to proceed with the, the operations. On royalties, um, the, there's a royalty payment as prescribed, uh, and the rates are there in the act, and those the royalties are paid to the state. I will give an example of royalties below. We also have that the royalties once received by this, the national government, um, there is a split for, of royalties in Kenya. 75% goes to the national government, 20% goes to the county government, and 10% goes to the local community. And there's a definition of the community uh, as being a group of people living around that exploration and mining operations area, or those who may be displaced from land intended for the exploration and mining operations. And we also have uh, within that act, the requirement for a community development agreement to be entered into between a large scale mining license holder and a local community. And I'll explain uh, on that a bit more. Um, the community development agreement uh, is, is basically has a couple of roles in the act. The first role is that I started from the end of the license period, but one of the roles is the renewal of the license. There'll be a need for the um, government to ensure that what was in the CDA was met by the uh, operator of the mine. There's the obligations under the mining licenses. Um, there's a prefer it's an obligation under the mining license to have a CDA. And then uh, preference in employment of the local community under section 47 and training issues to do with how many expatriates come in and are there Kenyans, local community and, and local Kenyans who can undertake that process uh, before you bring in an expatriate to do it, or even Kenyans in the diaspora who are able to undertake that work uh, before you bring in an, an actual expatriate. Then uh, it also, pro the CD also provides for community land management and compensation uh, for the community. So the CD is a very important agreement and it's one of the areas that lawyers would be heavily involved in drafting and uh, negotiation. Um, we also, there is a local content. So the Mining Act provides for um, preference of local products. We have a pending bill in the Senate that uh, was drafted uh, and brought through a, a private member's motion in the Senate uh, that was for local content uh, requirements. The bill is still ongoing and we wait to see how that will go. I've outlined a couple of the areas. Um, 
that have been some of the uh, proposals in that bill. I've outlined them in, in this slide. I slightly mentioned the Petroleum Act just uh, for purposes of, of knowledge that we do have that uh, dichotomy. We have uh, an, a Petroleum Act which provides for the EPRA uh, to regulate the petroleum sector. We also have the Act also provides for additional oil company uh, or contractors to undertake uh, petroleum operations. And, and this we speak of the upstream uh, part of petroleum operations. We also have a National Upstream Petroleum Advisory Committee whose role is to advise the CS on the upstream operations and also entering into PSC uh, production share contracts. And it does consist of representatives from the government ministries and also the Council of Governors. The Petroleum Act also provides for ratification by parliament of the field development plan um, that uh, is the one that the operator assigns with the government for purposes of developing a commercially viable, uh, commercially and technically viable uh, of field uh, or block. Um, it also provides for the uh, PSC, which, which is the model, it has a model production sharing contract. That model PSC is then used by the CS uh, when, come, when, when signing an agreement with a, a, a contractor, an upstream operator. And it has extensive obligations. You can be able to see that document. It has dispute resolution mechanisms. It has extensive obligations on surface fees, on exploration fees, on um, uh, on uh, surrender of areas of of areas of the blocks that have not been utilized and and all that. So, if if I move from the petroleum act also provides for local content and preference to local content in terms of jobs, goods and services and services, and also raising capital, and that all these shall be at market rate, uh, so that it encourages procurement of the local content. We in the energy act very brief mention we have geothermal resources, uh, and all those are unextracted resources under or in the land, uh, vested in the national government. And the cabinet secretary may authorize any person to make surveys, investigations, and measurements in search of geothermal resources. I will very quickly just skim through the Environmental Management and Coordination Act. Um, this provides for uh, NEMA, which is uh, our man uh, Environment Management Authority, and it has regulations. It also provides for standards enforcement and review committee, and this is for water quality, air quality waste and these are very key for mining it provides for eias and uh, environmental impact assessments which are we saw are a requirement under the mining act before you got a license and they also have the annual environmental audit report that is required some of the in the second schedule of mka you'll see projects that require an eia mining and mineral processing uh, petroleum all all these are require an eia before they are approved uh, for purposes of licensing. So what's in store for lawyers? And I think this is where we, we I would want to spend a bit of time, which I'm stealing from my next presenter. Um, quality titanium is an interesting one which you should look at. Um, they initially had challenges with the, and hurdles, the usual op op uh, opposition from environmental community concerns, which, which I believe uh, needed to be addressed at that point. And this was settled um, when we had representatives of the government and the community endorse the projects pre and post mining land use management plans. They also entered into CDA agreements, ar agreements and arrangements uh, with the local community, and they invested significant resources in the agricultural and education programs within, within the area. So as of uh, June this year, some of the results they got settled most of its debt uh, by June 2021 and uh, made uh, payments of almost 6.5 billion, sorry, I'll go back, uh, dividend in that period. They paid uh, net income of about 29 million dollars uh, during that period, paid the government of Kenya income taxes of about 1 billion shillings, royalties of about 1.5 billion and uh, withholding tax of maybe about 1 billion. So just by implementing the CDA and uh, also following through on a lot of uh, the issues that were raised, they, man they managed to turn, have the project run and turn around on 
the uh, cost of financing. Um, I know for maybe for Tanzania, these are not very big figures, but it is it is a, a good project um, that shows that if we are able to to work with the local community, uh, we can be successful. So if I look at the emerging areas, ESG uh, is becoming one of the biggest and most uh, influential area in regards to uh, mining and extractive sector. And the, this is basically environmental social and governance factors, and it deals mainly with sustainability, clean energy, and environmental protection. Amongst those, the areas that lawyers really need to look at is, you know, green recovery of minerals, adoption of development models that lessen the impact on the local community, uh, the environment, climate risks, and disaster risks. If in any project, if you're looking at it um, as an advocate, if you're aware the the different uh, hats, you know, whether it is to do with uh, mergers and acquisitions, whether you're wearing uh, a hat to do with land, uh, to do with land acquisition, EHS, environmental dispute resolution, all these themes that I'm going to go through keep coming up. And there are things that lawyers need to now start versing themselves with and understanding them com comprehensively. Um, when you talk of an inclusive, green, and resilient recovery, social and economic benefits uh, reaching the community. Um, we need to integrate ESG into corporate strategies, decision-making and stakeholder reporting, and then management of diversity and water. These are aspects that will come up as we go forward, and it's important for us as lawyers to, to verse ourselves with them, uh, to be able to support our clients in, in these transactions. The second, uh, the, the, the still under that, we have decarbonization, and this is really use of clean energy transition, uh, reducing emissions, use of wind and solar, uh, less of fossil fuel based technologies, and then scenario modeling and uh, reviewing funding. One of the things I would want to point uh, us to is that currently funding is, is um, financing of mineral and petroleum projects has, is slowly dwindling and what is available in the market is very keen on ensuring the decarbonization uh, of, the, of the specific projects that they are, they are investing in. Because also their investors of those funds are asking for these standards. And so these are standards that as advocates, we need to start appraising ourselves off and, and, uh, and, and having and versing ourselves in um, to enable them. The, the second one is, the license to operate and and this is mainly to do with the local community investment and support and uh, you might have a license but you may not be able to operate in the area you might have a, a legal document from the government that you may proceed and uh, start mining but if you don't have the community license to operate you will not be able to proceed and the things that uh, the themes that are under the license to operate include creating long term value for stakeholders uh, the cda agreements and community engagement access to information. So for example, in Kenya, we have the ratification process and we have uh, the cabinet secretary has a registry for the contracts. So people have access to this information and they're able to look at them. And uh, and uh, if there are any fears that they had, maybe allay them or enable them to ask questions. Then preference for local products and services. When we, when we draft contracts, when we look at uh, uh, operation contracts, for example, when them uh, uh, agreements, what are what is the preference for local products local value addition then there's a very key question on the free prime informed consent and this for example uh in kenya we have the ogx who went to court and uh, the african uh, court of human and people's rights and they did get a judgment against the kenyan government however one of the questions which i won't answer is is that government is that judgment um executable in Kenya, that's one. But secondly, do we have indigenous people in Kenya and what does the law say about that? So in every project that you, you get into large scale, especially large scale uh, mining project, you need to see what in the RAP process, what are, is there an FPIC uh, risk and does that risk, how is it managed? And to do that, you have to really uh, read and verse yourself about uh, the FPIC requirements under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So those are some of the areas I see on the license to operate. And the third one is I'll talk about access to financing. This is also a very key area for advocates and lawyers. 
um, the the access to capital is challenging for mining projects. I mean, it's a risky. Uh, um, it, it's it's always when you are in this uh, in in this industry, it's it's there's a risk of you your resource could run out. There's a risk of you could start and you don't finish the resource. So, um, the ESG. LTO and community issues and commodity pricing, those come into play. Uh, listing on the local stock exchange, we've seen it. Uh, government and community participation, and then the free prior informed consent. I'll just let you finally to, uh, and I know I've run out of time, um, look at the case study of Sierra Leone. They've recently um, enacted a law that covers a lot of these issues. It covers the FP, it talks about uh, industrial development, where can it be done? It incorporates a lot of the public environmental license conditions, uh, establishes local land use committees, and it also has very interestingly, a lot of um, uh, provisions that protect women, especially in the mining sector, because they are very vulnerable within the mining sector, especially when we talk about Ticino mining areas. So, this is a case study that I would request uh, all the participants to just read through, uh, look at the act, and, and uh, it's a very progressive act, which we may be able to learn from and see areas, legal, emerging legal areas within it. Uh, I've put in a list of, uh, of uh, references, um, and, uh, and I thank uh, the people, the team that helped me work on this. Um, and uh, hopefully, I will be waiting for your questions, and I hope this has been an informative session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gizaka. It was interesting to note the comments you have made and especially relating to communities and the local content bill, as well as the royalties that need to be paid. And of course, the environment preservation. We'll move over to Andre, who is from Burundi, and she shall speak about the regional bodies as well as opportunities for lawyers in that sector. Yes, over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Tabita. Uh, do you want me to only speak about opportunities or should I also address the first question? You can, you can handle both the opportunities as well as the issue where Burundi hosts the Secretariat of the International Convention on the Great Lakes Region. With reference to the ICGLR and the AC, you can interlink the role of the regional body as well as other bodies that have been, that are governing the mining area. Okay, thank you. I will try to go through it quickly. Um, thank you again for this opportunity. And uh, first, I would like to highlight that the International Convention on the Great Lakes Region was founded in 2006 against the backdrop of the war, the war in DRC. And that with the assistance of the African Union, the United Nations, and the electoral partners. So the ICGLR's main role is to transform the Great Lakes region into a space of sustainable peace and security for states and people, political and social stability, shared growth and development. And one length of enforcing this is through a protection and rational management of natural resources in the region and particularly in the mining sector. Now, uh, the state um, came together and signed a protocol on the fight against the illegal exploitation of natural resources. And through the protocol, they provide the legal basis for the implementation of uh, the regional initiative against the illegal exploitation of natural resources, uh, which was launched in 2009. And this outlines specific actions needed to translate the Great Lakes regions, rich mineral resources from a source of conflict into a catalyst for development. Then um, if I move to, to this initiative, it consists of six tools to fight against the 
the illegal exploitation of trade and natural resources. We have a regional certification mechanism for natural resources supply chains. And this is a regional standard document, uh, I mean, mechanism to combat uh, the illicit production and trade of tin, tantalum, tungsten, and gold, which has been linked to conflict and perpetration of gross human rights violation. And this has been drawn based on the OCD due diligence guidance for responsible mineral supply chains. The RCM is a mineral certification scheme that presents strong initiative incentives for artisanal and small scale mining through formalization at, at the regional level and has an inbuilt reporting requirement, which demands operators to report payment to government in line with the IITR reporting framework. So it is mainly based on two complementary standards, the standard for the inspection and certification of mine sites and the chain of custody standard. Both standards apply to industrial as well as artisanal mining operations. And this applies in the early stages of their implementation uh, business or activities. Uh, recently, the manual of the um, ECGL regional certification mechanism has been updated. And uh, regarding some statistics, we can note that um, in 2021 20, and early 2022, more than 20 third party audits were performed on regional treaty exporters across four countries including Burundi, DRC, and Tanzania in the region. So the RCM works um, by designing certain circumstances and outcomes of production and red, yellow, and green flags. By red flags, this means there is a violation of one of the system critical criteria of either the standard or procedures for mine site inspections and approval, or a violation of one of the system critical, the system critical criteria for the third party audit. So implementation of these um, mechanisms relies on mainly on four systems, chain of custody tracking from mine site to export, regional tracking of mineral flows, via the ICGL database and regular independent third party audits and an independent mineral chain auditor. Then there are other components of these uh, mechanisms because uh, there is a need for harmonize, to harmonize national legislation. And uh, under this point, a draft model law has been proposed to domesticate the protocol and developed proposals on how to refine the existing drafts and allow for all member states' needs to be respected and reflected in the, their legislation. So, so far, Uganda and Burundi has took necessary steps to begin harmonizing their legislation. There is also a need for construction of regional database on mineral flows. Here, I can only mention that uh, in order to fight the illegal exploitation of natural resources, um, the Secretariat has, I mean, member states have come, have come together and paved the way for the creation of the ECGL database with statistics on the production and trade of mineral resources. And the database system is hosted in the, in the ICGL Secretariat. So uh, there are many types of database. I will not um, spend time on this. And another aspect I would like to highlight is the formalization of artisanal mineral mining sector, but also the promotion of the extractive industry transparency initiative, peer learning mechanism. And, and the other component in this is the establishment of um, a white blowing mechanism through uh, this, this um, RCA me me mechanism. Uh, if 
um, we come to Burundi perspective, uh, the country being a member of the ICGR regional um, certification mechanism, it has been able to establish the, um, a, new a new legal framework, a ministerial ordinance in that regard, and it has adopted the mining inspection sheet from the uh, from the original certification mechanism to guide the mine site inspections according to the RCM standards. And the, the Ministry of Mine has conducted a number of initial inspection of mine sites. And uh, he also has been able to sign uh, an MOU with the ITRI and ISK started operations in April 2014. And these had conducted more than, based on this, the country has been able to conduct more than 28 baseline assessment and approved more than 34 cooperatives and have five um, uh, uh, mining business implemented in Burundi. Um, yeah, if I can say a little bit, um, some highlight from Burundi perspective. So when we come to the ESC, ESC as a regional body seeks to enable smooth implementation of commitment of partner state to take constant, co combine or aggregated measures to foster cooperation in the joint and efficient management and sustainable utilization of natural resources. So, so far we have the ESC protocol on environment and natural resources management of, from 2006. And um, partner states have adopted the environment impact assessment guidelines for shared ecosystems. And they have also developed an industrialization policy with a view to promote regional industries that use the regional natural resources to provide linkage among industries through diversification and complementary policies. Again, um, another major uh, achievement will be the ESC Territor Terrestrial Ecosystem Working Group, which has been made uh, in place together with the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. They are really working on, the, on how to harmonize a process of mineral policies and laws in the region. And again, recently, the ESC mining uh, bill has been introduced in 2017 to provide a legal framework for the regulation of mining operation in the community. And this was uh, in view to implement the ESC vision of 2050 and specifically to operationalize the, uh, some uh, provisions of the treaty which cause for harmonization of mining regulation to ensure environmentally friendly and sound many practices are put in place. And um, there are also uh, a major concern whereby partner states um, acknowledge that mineral exploitation has been focused on production for export without additional processing to add value in the form of intermediate goods or final product and to this end, the ESC Secretariat has proposed to establish a regional stakeholder technical committee on the development of mineral resources and, and mineral value addition. So this is briefly what has been done um, as what has been done in the by the regional region bodies and some of their initiatives that have been put in place. So in regarding to opportunities for lawyers in the mining sector, I will just highlight a few. I, be, um, I think uh, lawyers can provide strategic advice through the application process of mining license. They can represent either mining company, they can represent mining companies through the whole process of application. They can also reduce the risk of liability because a mining operation carries some risks and it is important that risks are properly accounted for 
within any application and the terms of granted license and associated approvals to adequately pro protect the company and ensure longevity of their operations. Again, lawyers can help um, a mining company to establish, to establish legal parameters of their operations so that they can confidently undertake extraction and exploration, knowing where their legal rights extend to and where they stop. So briefly, in addition to what the previous speakers have said, this is what I can add. Thank you and over to you, Mugo. Tabitha, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, for highlighting the, the role of regional bodies, as well as the various treaties that lawyers can consider when advising on at the application stage and also advising on the sustainable development of minerals and the entire economic activity that relates to mining. So we have now come to the end of the presentation by the speakers of the day. And I'll hand over to Loyola, who will be handling the Q&A session from my part. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. And we shall summarize after the, the chair has given his final remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mugo. And uh, thank you uh, to Nyamu and Ajed for, again, very insightful presentations. We are running out of time, but we did start slightly after 2 p.m. So I'll request the Secretariat and IT to, you know, just let us go over a little bit. I hope 20 more minutes should be good. Uh, now we dive into the real crux of this webinar that I'm sure our participants are most interested in. After all that information and knowledge from our speakers, I will go to the Q, to the questions that have come up. So I'll start with a question for Ambassador, I believe Ambassador Maja or Dawoodi, who is also online. If uh, either one of you could address these two questions. There's a question from Vincent Mtavangu and, and he asks to what extent the Tanzanian mining legal regime has addressed the issues of local content and what is the practice in the field? Yes, I believe that is uh, addressed to, yes, that is that is one question. If you could kindly uh, quickly answer that one um, in, in, in one minute, if possible. Thank you. Daudi, you want to go on, to, on that? Uh, yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Ambassador. Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, yes, Tanzania has um, um, uh, addressed the issue of uh, local content and uh, they have enacted uh, local content uh, regulations, which are, um, they do provide for uh, certain thresholds, uh, especially for um, goods and services um, for parties which, who, who wish to uh, provide services and uh, for companies wishing to procure uh, some goods. And uh, so far the Mining Commission is um, uh, in the process of uh, receiving, uh, receiving um, um, the local content plans, reviewing them and, uh, and, uh, and uh, making sure that um, uh, they are all up to the provisions of the law and the regulations. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Dawoodi. Uh, thank you for that answer, Dawoodi. The next question came up in the chat box, and this is to Dennis. Can Dennis give an indication on how arbitration practice in Uganda supports mining law practice in terms of skills and structures currently? I did not get the name of the person who asked that question. Yes, but I hope you had it. Mm. Okay, arbitration in Uganda supporting mining law practice. Yes. Um, maybe what I can say is arbitration in mining in, pro in projects where government can accept to go for arbitration because government does not always go for arbitration except for large complex projects. They don't just go for arbitration for smaller projects. 
but most of the projects that uh, agree to arbitrate with government on those large projects do not uh, want to arbitrate in Uganda. They want a neutral ground. But what I can say is that because we have the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, which uh, provides for enforcement of awards that have, that have been uh, given against government, um, to that extent, the investors are happy to, to, to know that if they, they got an award against the government of Uganda, the, the, the laws of Uganda, which includes the Arbitration Act, provides for enforcement of that award as if it were, were a decree of court in Uganda. So I think that's the extent to which uh, arbitration could support uh, mineral development. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question is from an anonymous attendee. It does not um, identify a specific speaker, but it was typed while Dennis was speaking. So it may be addressed to you or any other speaker may address this. The question is, can a landowner who hasn't been compensated for their rights in land mine stones, gravel or aggregate from his land where a third party holds a mining license for dimensional stones? Um, in Uganda, uh, the mineral definition of what minerals are excludes gravel and 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 uh, stones that are commonly used for building construction. Uh, stones like uh, granite, stuff like sand, clay, are excluded. Um, however, if you have the stone, you know, you can find gold in the granite also. If now the mineral is, is hidden in the granite, <laughs> then there is an interesting debate there because uh, then now we, what is, what is, is it minerals or it's, it's, it's a stone? Um, I think you can have uh, cooperation. After all, a mining lease cannot be granted unless you have secured what we call surface rights, at least under Ugandan law. So if the landholder is aware that they have stone that falls outside the definition of minerals, they can exclude that from, um, from, 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 from um, what is being ceded to the mining company, to the extent that the mining company can be able to exploit the minerals without hindrance. Otherwise, um, it's a tricky one if there is a mixture, if the gold was in the sand and, and now you, you, are, you are fighting over the sand, there could be a problem there. May, may I go there um, uh, for clarity? Uh, the Mining Act in Tanzania is very clear in terms of surface rights and um, below the surface rights. Um, all minerals are vested onto the president uh, for the benefit of all Tanzanians. It doesn't matter if you have surface rights in terms of um, um, certificate of title over land, but what happens is, and we do not distinguish, our law does not distinguish between uh, the type of minerals for industrial minerals and, uh, and uh, other minerals. All minerals are considered minerals and they are licensed. You cannot exploit them without a license. Now there is a requirement that protects surface rights user or surface rights uh, holder uh, or occupier um, by the fact that the license holder cannot enter the land, the subject of its license, if uh, without first seeking the consent of the surface rights uh, holder. And that consent will be in a way that will allow uh, compensation subject to certain uh, compliance requirements to be paid to the lawful occupier, the landholder, the surface right holder. Even if you are only grazing cattle, you will be entitled to compensation. Uh, and um, that compensation will be actually supervised by government. And the, the ministry is is in its interest to ensure that the license order holder eventually gets um, access. Uh, so they will also be close by watching the process. 
and the uh, uh, other laws, of course, that um, provide for the nature of compensation, the type of compensation, how to value land, how not to to speculate or to overvalue that land, and how uh, much you will be paid for natural trees or for fruits or developments. So the law is very, very clear, and I think it's one of the clearest uh, legislations that protects p existing people on the land. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And it's very helpful to get uh, two different perspectives. And I think um, for, for me, the clarity there, the, the issue there is on how clear the law is and it appears the law in Tanzania is, is provides much more clarity but the benefit is that there is so much um, litigation and legal interpretation that has happened around the definition of minerals for example in Uganda so we, we can definitely um, learn from that and continue to clarify thank you so the next question um, is from I, Mr. sorry yes. if, you, if you allow me uh, very yes, quickly please. In yes. the Kenyan in the Kenyan court context, I think our, we are very close to the Tanzanian interpretation because uh, in Section Six of the Mining Act, it very clearly states that uh, every mineral uh, in the natural state, whether it's under lake, river, or sea, in or in the exclusive economic zone, is a property of the republic and is vested in a national government in trust for the people of Kenya. Um, when it comes to land access, I think that that we also is very close to uh, Tanzania's position that you have to then find access could be either by acquisition of the land, um, which could be through <clears throat> compulsory acquisition if the government wants to, or you could have leases or, or licenses or way leaves that allow you to access the land, which you have to then have a discussion with the landowner and that's the reason when you look at the community land which is essentially owned by the community you have the community development agreement which also has uh, the land rights and land management within it and and it uh, also talks about restoration of the land after the mining operations are complete thank you thank you so much nyamo actually just even based on this quick discussion, I think our next webinar may simply be on land access rights and the mining industry and coexistence of, coexistence of different land uses. I think we can all agree it's a similar trend in, in all the countries in the region. So the next question is for you, uh, Mr. Githaka, again. A question for Nyamo, what impact does the ICJ decision, that's the International Court of Justice, decision on the Kenya-Somalia maritime border delimination dispute have for the future of national mining rights and regulations for Kenya to specify Kenya's right, um, Kenya's right to extract mineral resources in the disputed exclusive economic zone. I hope you can address that in uh, two minutes. I will address it in, in, in shorter than two minutes. I think it's a trick question, really. <laughs> um, what I'll do is uh, I'll just point uh, the person. I mean, I'm not competent to answer this because I'm, I'm not in government. But there is a very specific statement uh, from His Excellency, Excellency the President Uru Kenyatta on uh, 13th October 2021 in respect to the delimitation uh, case. And I think maybe I would just point the person to the official portal of the government uh, to look at that statement, and I believe it answers the question. I, it wouldn't be fair for me to go through, to read through the statement, but that's the official position of the Republic of Kenya, as stated by the, its highest chief, chief executive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Githaka, and thank you also for that very clever and diplomatic way of, of you know, addressing trick questions. Um, yes, and finally, the next question, at least in the Q&A box, and I will address this to Ange, to Ange, given her amazing expertise with regional bodies and regional international law. Ayi Bonabol Badut has asked, uh, what role can ESC lawyers play in mitigation of resources costs in some ESC states? Thank you, Loyola. Uh, yeah, it has been a reality and uh, yeah, that countries are not really benefiting from their um, uh, their potentialities in mineral 
um, sector. So I would say maybe through advocacy, lawyers could highlight the rationale to their respective state to ensure a speedy realization of approximate uh, or realization of um, commitment, EAC commitment into their national laws. So if maybe there is a full implementation of the common market protocol, this will be one way among many ways for this um, issue to be uh, resolved. And uh, maybe another way is uh, to, to try to write as much as possible papers uh, and through other non-litigation forms of advocacy in order to attempt to influence the development of the of uh, the realization of the community engagement into domestic laws yeah this is briefly what i can say about that thank you thank you very much angie and i think i'll just quickly add um as you see from the speakers we have endeavored to address questions that to address issues in the mining industry that cut across the entire region. Uh, but we will, in the future, have speakers from all the countries that, that were not represented here today, including South Sudan, DRC, and Rwanda. So it, we, we, um, we are very happy to hear all these perspectives. Um, I think that is it for the questions we got in the in the Q&A, so I, I think we've addressed all of them. So I'll take this opportunity to invite Daudi back as the chairperson of the Mining Law Committee to give us his closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Loyola, uh, and uh, all other participants. Um, indeed, it has been a very wonderful session. Uh, we have benefited a lot. Uh, we've had uh, quite interesting perspective from um, uh, from um, the East African uh, countries. Uh, and as you've said, Loyola, perhaps uh, we have already gotten a topic for the next webinar. Uh, it will be interesting to explore how, what are the variations uh, when it comes to land, land, land rights and the surface rights and the uh, underneath right when it comes to um, mining legislation in these countries. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, all the speakers uh, for giving us um, your uh, ideas on what as lawyers we should concentrate on, uh, especially um, uh, understanding the fact that, you know, the mining um, sector is really dynamic. Things are really, really changing. Now people are starting to think about um, or talk about the ESG, the environmental aspects, the social and governance issues. Uh, which were not there. So it is very important for us to invest more time in understanding all these issues, understanding the entire value chain so that uh, at least we can um, be able to um, uh, carry out our duties and advise our clients uh, and be more of value. Uh, without uh, taking much time, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, thank you so much.